function of R and S. And I'd now like to figure out what C is. Um, <coughs> there's a nice, easy way to figure out what C is. We're just going to take the trace of B and see what we land up getting. Um, so let's do that now. What we want to calculate, we want to calculate the trace of B, A, A, R, S. Now, I've been telling you everywhere that whenever you see a repeated index, you should sum. For this one equation, do not sum over A. So let me... No sum on A. So let's see why this is a good thing to look at. Well, let's take a look. If we take the trace from here, we're going to get CRS. <coughs> and when this delta KJ, that's just a unit matrix. So we're just going to be adding up all of the ones on the diagonal. So we're going to get the dimension of representation A. And let's now calculate this thing again, but using our definition of BAB. So the two reps are the same. So I'm going to have, again, a sum over T is an element of G. OK, and I've got a gamma A of T. And I'll put indices on in a moment. And a gamma A of t to the minus 1. When I take the trace, I'm setting k equal to j and summing. So if I take a look at this, there's the i j. I must set this first index equal to that index. OK? So if this is an i, that must be an i. And r s are now the inside indices. So R, S are the inside indices. OK, everyone happy with that? So let's take a look and see what this is. <coughs> this is equal to, well, and, and in, uh, over here, of course, again, so, so let me just, we are summing on I. I is repeated, we sum on I, no sum on A. Now, if we sum on i, using the fact that this is a representation of the group, we just get sum. t is an element of g, gamma a, t. OK, so I'll put it down. So we have uh, t to the minus 1 t, s r, which is a sum t element of g. The identity, s r. Now, this sum on t is an element of g. Well, nothing depends on, on t anymore. The t's have disappeared. So we're just going to get a 1 for each time that we sum. So we're going to get g, the order of the group. And we've got the identity matrix, delta r s. So now we compare this to this. And what we learn is we learn <coughs> c r s. DA is equal to G delta RS. And what that tells us is now we've got a formula for BAB. So I'll, I'll write that formula out in full glory. Um, so where is BAB? It's sitting over there. So we've got a sum over T, which is an element of G. Gamma A T I R A T I R gamma b t to the minus 1 sj. So what is this equal to? Well, we've got a delta ab. We've got a delta rs. We've got a delta ij. And we've got a g divided by, uh, where was it? dA. So there's our result. Now, 
I should come clean about one thing. So what I did do is over here, um, so I glibly told you to replace gamma A of E equal to delta RS. One of the things that you might ask me is, is the matrix representing the identity always the unit matrix? Okay, the answer is yes, it is always the unit matrix. Um, and the way to see that is, um, well, if we take gamma of E, this is now for any matrix rep, times by gamma of E, that's equal to gamma of E because the identity composes with the identity to give you one. So if I pull this over to this side, I learn that gamma of E into gamma of E minus the unit matrix is equal to naught. But that guy is invertible, okay, because the inverse of every element must appear in the group. If that guy is invertible, the only solution to this equation is that gamma of E is equal to the identity matrix, okay? So I use that fact. So, so that's our result. This is called the fundamental orthogonality relation. And it can be put to really, really good use. So let's put this down. This is the fundamental orthogonality relation. <coughs> okay, now, let's check. What we're interested in, of course, is continuous groups, something like Lie groups. Is there an anal analogous result for Lie groups? Well, yes, there will be an analogous result for Lie groups when we can relabel our sum, which will now be an integral in this way, and the measure will be invariant. Um, for those of you who know something about um, groups, if, you're, if your Lie group is compact, that will always be the case. So that's been proved carefully. Um, but there's a slight change to this result. And the reason why there's a slight change is it comes in with this value of g. Where did this value of g cam come in? It came from summing over all t, which is an element of g. So when we're talking about a finite group, we usually have this sum normalized to g, the, the number of elements in the group. Now, when you think about a Lie group, there's an infinite number of elements. So that would be a stupid normalization. So the normalization that we have in the case of a, of a Lie group, we say that the sum over all group elements over the group manifold is usually normalized to 1. That's a much better normalization to choose. And with that normalization, the fundamental orthogonality um, relation becomes the following. This is how we write it. <coughs> we say that, so we're going to replace that sum by an integral over the group, gamma A of T, I, R, gamma B of T, so this is to the minus 1, S, J, DT is equal to delta A, B, delta R, S, delta I, J over D, A. I just mentioned that because you guys will probably see things in the context of Lie groups, um, so I wanted you to know that the result carries over for that. There's quite a bit of work that goes into defining exactly what you mean by that integral and looking at the various symmetries that that measure would have. So I, I don't want to do that here. Okay. One more thing that I do want to do today is I'd like to show you that if we're dealing with a finite group, and in fact this is also true for, for um, groups, Lie groups, which you can change the measure in this way, then you can prove that every single representation that you have is equivalent to a unitary representation. And the reason why that's a useful result is that from now on, we're going to restrict ourselves to unitary representations, and we know that we're still being absolutely general because every rep is equivalent to a unitary rep. Um, okay, so how do we prove that? Um, well, we'll do it as follows. <coughs> Actually, before we start on that, let me just ask, um, does anybody have any questions on the fundamental orthogonality relation? Yes, Noreen. Okay. You know what? I, I hope that this will satisfy you. What we're going to do tomorrow is um, we're, we're going to look at 
characters of SO3, so you know what characters are. We're going to look at them for SO3, and we're going to use that formula. One of the things that that formula will allow us to do is it will allow us to work out what is the irreducible representation content of a product of two other representations. And what we'll be able to relate that to, in quantum mechanics, you probably went through the exercise of taking a particle of spin J1 and coupling it to a particle with spin J2 and figuring out what were the possible allowed angular momenta. Okay? So we'll see, for example, statements like that can be read off of that fundamental orthogonality relation. Okay? So, so I'm going to ask you to, to hold off with that question till then. Um, I am going to try to give you some sort of physical interpretation in, in various cases. Um, I don't know, is, is there anyone sitting in the audience who's got a nice interpretation for fundamental orthogonality relation? Physical interpretation? Clifford, maybe? Yeah. Okay. So, so Noreen, tomorrow I promise we'll do angular momentum. And that's the best I can do for you now. So, so, yes, so, so the gamma A and gamma B, yes, that's true. Those are, those are irreducible representations. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, on this side, okay, A is equal to B. So in other words, if you consider two different irreducible representations, you just get naught, okay? So, well, well, it follows from this formula, right? Because... The only time this is non-zero is when we've got the same rep here as we have here. Okay? In fact, you could plug in two irreducible representations that have the same dimension, and as long as they were different irreducible representations, you'd still get naught. That's what that formula tells you. Okay? D does that answer your question? Good. Okay. So now let's show that um, every representation is equivalent to a unitary rep. So let's imagine that we start off, and I'm going to prove it like this. We're going to start off with some rep, and then I'm going to show you how to get a unitary rep from it. So let's say we've got a matrix uh, um, representation of the group, so gamma of T. This is going to act on a ket. And the ket that I'm going to get from acting with gamma of T on that ket, I am going to call... T, V. So that's the ket that I get. <coughs> now, I haven't told you how to calculate inner products on this space. I'm going to use an interesting inner product. The inner product that I'm going to use is this one. So here we've got a, a G. V, V prime, G is equal to um, 1 over G um, sum T is an element of G, gamma of T, V, um, gamma of T, V prime. So let's make sure we, we know what we're saying here. So this inner product here is the usual inner product. I've just taken my vector. To go from a ket to a bra, I take the transpose and I complex conjugate. And then I would contract them the way I contract vectors usually to get an inner product. So use the rules for contracting. Um, what is it? So, so this would be a row. So this would be a 1 by D into a D by 1 matrix. Okay? So use those usual rows. That's the inner product that I mean on this side. I'm now summing over all elements in the group. I'm normalizing with 1 over the order of the group. And I'm defining this to be equal to an inner product. So this subscript G is just to remind you that when you compose these two vectors, you don't use it, do it using the usual inner product. Um, this is a new definition of an inner product. And now what I would like to show you is with this inner product, this representation is unitary. So how do I do that? Well, what do I mean when I say I've got a unitary representation? I mean the inner product is preserved. 